Last week, we started off our sermon series, the Stop the Grinch. And we dove into Hebrews chapter 10 and a discussion around gathering together as fellow disciples of our Savior Jesus Christ. As always, if you missed last week or any of our other sermons, or you want to re-listen to it, you want to pass it along to your friends or your coworkers, whoever it may be, you can catch it on our website, peacechurch.org. You can catch it on our social media channels as well. We purposely started this sermon series in November in hopes that God will do what he promises to do in his word and actually transform our hearts going into one of the busiest seasons of the year for so many of us. Life doesn't seem to be slowing down much, even as our nation and the world slowly starts to come out of this pandemic state of mind. And there's glimmers of the end of this pandemic as as tiny little stars growing brighter and brighter. Lord willing, that end will come sooner rather than later. But the struggle that I'm personally feeling, and maybe you are too, is that as things start to look ever more normal, I continue to struggle with the same things I did even before the pandemic. After almost two years of an interrupted life and culture, I still feel like I have the same discussions with God about my own struggles. And I, and I try to do that in prayer. And pastorally, I, I seem to be walking with people who are sharing a similar sentiment. I mention this because I think I'm surprised myself at how similar my conversations are with God this year compared to years in the past. And I've seen the same surprise and frustration as others in their own struggles. And even the struggles of others and those around them continue year after year, month after month, week after week, and sometimes even day after day. But it's important that we remember this is just reality for us, generation after generation, right? Think about the last major tragedy and crisis in our nation. September 11th, almost 20, well, over 20 years ago at this point. Things seem to be interrupted and different for a few months. But by the summer of, of 2002, it seemed the same conversations were happening and the same struggles in our culture and our nation. But this is pretty significant for us to remember. Our Savior's truth and grace does something different for you and me. And that something different that something different in our experience can be a difference maker in the lives of those that God places around us. So we're going to dive into that this morning as we talk about what it means to stop the Grinch. Grab your Bibles, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. After the four Gospels, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, use your table of contents Grab your neighbor's Bible if they beat you to 2 Corinthians 4. Whatever it takes, just get to 2 Corinthians 4, chapter, verse 1. And as you're getting there, let me give you a little bit of context uh, for the sake of our conversation this morning. This is the second letter we have from Paul to the Corinthians in the Scriptures. Though some scholars would argue that there's probably a third or a fourth letter, and this is somewhere in that mix. His first letter to the Corinthians strongly spoke against some of the sin and the brokenness that was taking place in that gathering of believers in Corinth. And he encouraged them to live out their true identity in Christ. So to put away their old selves and and live in that resurrected life in Jesus. And so in some ways, this letter, as we have it, 2 Corinthians, isn't as harsh as the first, but there's still this strong tone of admonishment from Paul to the believers in Corinth. All right, so 2 Corinthians chapter 4, let's start with verse 1. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose hearts. Well, to understand what Paul's talking about here in this verse and a little bit further, it's important that we go up a few verses and understand what he's talking about with the therefore. All right, so go up to chapter 3, verse 16. Paul writes this, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. So when one comes into faith, when the Spirit of God works persuasion of faith in a person's heart, and they believe in our Savior, that veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord there is 
freedom. I want you to say it with me because we don't have to hesitate on this verse. You ready? Verse 17, now the Lord is the Spirit. I don't hear you saying it with me. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. He continues in verse 18, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Which then he continues in verse 1, Therefore, having this ministry, by the mercy of God, we do not lose hearts. Right? So in that freedom of the Lord and the freedom of the Spirit continues how we live our lives as beloved and redeemed disciples of Christ. So what follows in chapter 4 comes out of the transformation of the Spirit of God that Paul explains in chapter 3. So let us consider that what God has called us to in this season and every other season of our lives, comes from a purpose greater than our present experience. The interactions we have with others, the emotions that we feel, the emotions that we express, the words that we share with one another, and the Spirit of God are all to be transformed to God's greater purpose through us. In the redemption and transformation each of us experiences in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me simplify that a little bit with a formula that I know many of you have seen before. Our redemption leads to our faithful obedience. Out of our identity in Christ, out of His transformation, our lives have a greater purpose and we live them in faithful obedience. It is because of what Christ has done for us in His mercy and grace that we live our lives in His purpose and not our own. And that's important because of what I said at the beginning of the sermon. Maybe your experience at the end of 2021 is similar to your experience at the end of 2020. Or similar to your experience at the end of 2019. Or maybe going all the way back to 1986 or 1956, whatever it may be, your experience presently does not change who you are eternally in our Savior Jesus Christ and what his death and resurrection has won for you. Namely, four things life, salvation, redemption, freedom. We don't have to keep waiting for our experiences to change to actually begin experiencing change. Did you hear that? We don't actually have to wait for our experience to change to begin experiencing change. Instead, we go back to what is true for us and our Savior, that we are His beloved and redeemed. That he has won for us life, freedom, redemption, salvation. That we are his beloved child and we move forward from there. We live our lives in faithful obedience according to who we are in our Savior Jesus Christ. Paul talks about it in this way. Go down to verse 7. But we have this treasure, life, salvation, freedom, hope in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. For we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body of the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Remember that Paul and those who traveled with him suffered some tremendously difficult experiences. As they were shipwrecked, they were imprisoned, they were stoned, they were thrown out of cities, they were starved, and so much more happened to them that we don't even know. But go back up to verse 7. Grab a pen, grab a pencil, grab something. And I want you to highlight, circle, underline what he says in verse 7. But we have this 
treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. And right next to verse 7, I want you to write the word hope. That is the treasure that we have in these fragile jars of clay. This means that our experience, our present experience, whether we feel like we are suffering or feel like we're on top of the world, our present experience isn't for our glory. It is for God's glory and that His power might be shown through us. And it's here that I think we get confused on how, on how we actually live this out. Because we want to think that this means God is going to change our circumstances so that His power is revealed and we just need to hang on a little bit tighter to make it through. How's that working out for you? Consider what we know about Paul. Every struggle and circumstance that he experienced, every single one of them, he utilized as an opportunity to proclaim the gospel. The good news that in Christ's death and resurrection, every person could have salvation. It's recorded in the book of Acts. Every struggle he faced, he proclaimed the good news of Jesus. Paul took every opportunity... And even increasingly so, when he was being persecuted or mistreated, to live out the mercy and the grace and the compassion of Jesus Christ to those around him. Which should beg us to ask the question, why? Why would Paul do such a thing? I would argue it's because Jesus had so transformed Paul's life that he could not help but let Christ's mercy pour out through him to the world around him, to those he interacted with, the jailers, the religious leaders, the people who stoned him. So can I ask you another personal question? As you've been going to stores in the last couple of weeks, or sitting in traffic, or even interacting with fellow disciples at work, or maybe even this morning, has the mercy and grace of Christ been what's pouring out through you? I ask that question because I asked it of myself this week. And I can stand before you and honestly say the answer to that question for me was no. I often fall way short of living this out in my life. See, that, that's why verse 1 in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is so important to understanding the rest of this section. We're not, we're not given this treasure in jars of clay because we do it so well or we do it so perfectly. We are called into this life through the mercy of God so that His glory may be revealed and not ours. How is His glory revealed then when we fall so short of living out our faithful obedience? Well, I'd propose a couple of ways. It's right there in the text. Number one, when we suffer, we're not crushed. We are not crushed because in us lives the Savior whose death conquered death, (laughs) whose love raised Him from the dead on Easter morning, and because Our lives are lived out in the purpose of bringing Him glory, honor, and praise. If we were crushed in our despair, how is God glorified in that moment? This doesn't mean it's not going to be incredibly difficult. This doesn't mean at times it's not going to be overwhelming. This doesn't mean we we won't lose our strength to hold on. Paul refers to us as jars of clay. Something that is incredibly fragile. But even in its fragility, it is not crushed. When we do suffer, when we do feel overwhelmed, when we do lose our strength, and our faith turns to our Savior, His glory shines through us. And we get a glimpse of what it means when the Scriptures say, 
he gives us a peace that passes all human understanding. And because we're not crushed when we suffer, we can extend grace more and more. This grace doesn't come from within ourselves. It comes from our Savior, Jesus Christ. This grace pours out from us so that what is true about us, that we are not crushed when we, are, when we suffer, can also be true of those that God places in our lives. That in Him, they too would not be crushed. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I, who are redeemed in Christ, live for His glory, honor, and praise. We suffer and struggle. And if we who live for the glory, honor, and praise of God suffer and struggle, how much more do those around us who don't live for the glory and honor of God? Their struggle doesn't justify their rudeness or their meanness or their sign language they use as they pass us on the highway. It doesn't justify any of their behavior any more than it does ours. But the difference is that you and I have the message of freedom that can transform their lives, not only in the present experience, but also for eternity. We extend grace more and more because it's only in the grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ, that their lives will ever change. And it's only in the grace of our Savior Jesus Christ that this world might be just a little bit better of a place to dwell. It's hard to treat people with kindness when you get the opposite in return. If you've ever worked customer service, you know what I'm talking about. And as much as we don't want to say the truth, it is slightly satisfying to just release a little bit of frustration on somebody else that's built up inside of you, even when they don't deserve it. Don't shake your head no at me, because I know that you've done it too. But fellow disciples of our Savior Jesus Christ, our redemption, who we are in our Savior, leads to our faithful obedience. Because of what Christ has done for us, because of who we are in Him, because that reality never changes in His mercy and grace. Our lives have a greater purpose than you and me in this present experience. Because of who we are in Christ, our lives can now be lived in a purpose that is greater than you and me. It's greater than our deepest struggles. It's greater than our present experience. And that purpose, that life lived on purpose, can actually bring Life and salvation and redemption and freedom to somebody as they experience our Savior Jesus Christ through us, through our words, through our actions, through our love. So this season, we stop the Grinch. But number one, giving ourselves some margin. Because the reality is, is that none of us are our best selves when we're operating on fumes. And the season of of the year is often one that has survived and not necessarily lived. So give yourself some margin. Don't go out every weekend of the next month and a half or feel like you have to attend every event this season. Don't plan a party every weekend. Don't shop until you drop. Don't spend hours upon hours in traffic trying to run to the store. Use Amazon instead. But in all seriousness, rest, relax, be intentional about being refreshed, be renewed, spend some time restoring relationships, and I would encourage you, especially the relationship that you have with your Savior. Because in that time of margin is when we are actually reminded who we are in our Savior and that His love for us is not based on our performance. And when we dwell in that relationship, we actually have that peace that passes all human understanding. Which then leads us to do number two, which is invite others into peace. Just because they cut you off doesn't mean you have to do the same thing to them. 
And just because their tone of voice wouldn't be acceptable for your dog at home doesn't mean you have to match that same tone. Our Savior had an incredible ability to turn the tone of a conversation in love and by doing so actually pierce a person's heart. Our Savior now lives in each of us by His Spirit. And as He lives in us, we also have the opportunity to bring His peace into every conversation, every interaction, every experience. And so as others vent their frustrations and perspectives and their opinions, and you're having to sit with family around a meal that you don't really want to be a part of this season, invite others into the peace of our Savior Jesus Christ. By being that presence of peace yourself. Because after all, that that brief moment of peace might be the seed. Or it might be exactly what they need. To be led into the arms of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'll end with with Paul's encouragement. At the end of chapter 4, verse 13. He says, since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written. I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. This moment, this present experience, is not the end. And it's also not the most important. What is to come in our Savior actually is. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. As we stop the Grinch this season, may our Savior's glory shine in you, through you, into the world around you. And may he focus our hearts and minds on the things that are eternal. Our life, our redemption, our salvation, our freedom in him, our Savior Jesus Christ. In his most precious name, amen.